All right, I think um, let's get going and uh, good day wherever you are from in the world. Uh, we're coming to you from South Africa, at the bottom of Africa where it's a beautiful sunny day today. Uh, my name is Anton Grutter, I'm the Lean uh, the R&D director of the Lean Institute Africa. I've been with uh, LEA since we started in 2008 at the uh, Graduate School of Business of University of Cape Town. And before that, I taught at another university here in Cape Town. We're a small institute, but we've worked in diverse sectors such as manufacturing, healthcare, mining, finance, NGOs, and even in the justice system. So please uh, do ask questions in the chat during the presentation and we'd be happy to respond at the end. Uh, and now let me get on to introducing our speakers. Uh, ben Hoseas partners with organizations on the journey of continuous improvement and operational excellence as a coach and an advisor. He has wide experience in operations, supply chain, human resources and project management in a variety of sectors in many different parts of the world. Tsepo Tobiane is a director at the Lean Institute Africa. He has worked in improvement roles in the private and public sector for the past 18 years. And his particular interest is to assist organizations to determine how to integrate continuous improvement into their business architecture with a clear link to the organization's strategy. And then last but not least, Mr. Gray Dubey <coughs> retired as CEO of Leratong Hospital after a career of 47 years in the Department of Health in Gauteng province of South Africa. He led the adoption of lean management at the hospital and it was so successful that he was invited to present at the Catalysis Lean Healthcare Summit in 2018 and 2019. So without further ado, can I hand over to Ben so that he can get us going? Absolutely, and thank you, Anton. It's a pleasure to be with you guys from around the world. I did just wanna take a moment to reflect on how neat of an event this has been, uh, to be able to interact and engage with people from around the world 24 hours. So big thank you to the Lean Global Network and the team at LAI for putting this on. And uh, you see us there in South Africa in the middle. I was a little disappointed when we did the poll of which country would you like to visit. South Africa was not doing very strong, but don't let that variant news scare you away. Please come and visit. It's a beautiful part of the world. So uh, a brief background of my story. I started out in the US, as you can probably tell. I had the, the privilege and the opportunity to work for Toyota Kentucky there for a number of years as a human resource specialist. And that indoctrinated me along with my upbringing with my father, Michael Hoseas, who you heard speak yesterday into the world of lean leadership. And so um, since then, I've really had a heart to go out and learn and understand and do, and that's led me to Australia. I lived in Melbourne for a couple of years, and uh, that offered the opportunity to work in different parts of Southeast Asia, and then um, across the US into Europe a bit, and then in South Africa. My heart has been here since I first stepped foot in Cape Town back in 2017. I had the privilege on my second day in the city to meet Anton and go out and visit a fantastic organization that's using lean principles to drive community development. So I knew from day one that if you wanted to go be in a lean environment and a lean team, do that in a place that has tremendous upside, tremendous opportunity for growth and a population that is willing to learn. So that's uh, that's what's led me here. And it's a privilege again to be with Anton and Seppo and Mr. Gray Dubé. Um, and they'll be sharing more with you here momentarily. So we want to introduce some of our leadership traits for the next generation. And I've done this presentation or versions of it several times now, and it's traditionally been in the vein of millennials. So how do you get millennials engaged? How do you get millennials to stick around in the company? And um, I think it has become outdated a little bit because Gen Z is now entering the workforce and different aspects are shifting with that. And so I stepped back and said, these principles are applicable uh, more so to leadership. And how do we bring our people into an environment that is conducive for problem solving, conducive for engagement, and that really uh, inspires them enough to be able to stay. And we've said now recently in the age of COVID, uh, it's very easy to shift where you work. So if I'm not enjoying, or if I'm not finding fulfillment, 
my current role, all that it would take me to switch a job is to change where I would log into Zoom or whatever platform you use. So we've never seen it um, as quick as a resignation as it's been. That's what they're calling it in the US. So I would say now more than ever, it's important that we focus on how do we build these types of environments and systems for our people that are again, conducive to their growth and development. So as a leader, these are the three key traits that we want to focus on for our time today. Um, I'll touch on courage and collaboration, and then I'll let uh, Seppo and Mr. Gray work through a, an interview and a great kind of case study from his experience around curiosity and some of these other leadership traits. So with courage, let's touch on a key uh, couple of subtask or sub elements here. So clarity and empathy and sound like nice words, but I would say clarity for me is clarity first of thinking. And so when you walk into the factory floor at a Toyota facility, wherever you are in the world, you'll see it widely emblazed on the banners there that says good thinking, good products. And I love that. So every day walking in, it's just a good reminder to ground yourself and focus on, again, where are we now? Where are we heading? What uh, is the standard and what should be happening? So I wanted to put this slide up around clarity to start set the stage of a nice progression. And we've heard some great case studies and lectures from our other speakers this last few hours. Um, how do we use Lean? How do we use Agile? How do we use Six Sigma, et cetera, to really drive this transformation and drive this progress across an enterprise? So I like this quick four phases, um, just as a nice, simple framework to give us a grounding of what it would mean to establish clarity in the organization. And so again, phase one, we're setting a clear purpose direction and we're asking that question, what should be happening? And you heard my father speak yesterday, perhaps, that when we work our way from phase one to phase two, it becomes so important and critical to set a target and define that standard. Because if the team doesn't have consensus or the team is not clear about what the standard should be, then it just becomes a matter of guesswork and a matter of opinion. And um, I've been fighting some battles with that recently and it's just how much or how many, and people call them junk words sometimes. And we say, oh, there's a lot of problems we're dealing with or this should be that high. And when it's subjective by nature, you obviously can't have a clear basis from which to improve. So no standard, no problem is a great tenant to come back to as a leader and how you set that standard within your organization. Phase three, so making the problems visible. So we all know the lean tools. I'm sure we've all had different levels of education, certification, et cetera, around what these tools can do. And we know they're very effective when you apply them in the context of a bit. All right, Ben, we lost you there for a moment. but it truly is around this idea that any of the lean tools that we're putting into practice are there to make problems visible and surface those for discussion. So moving into phase four, this is where it gets difficult perhaps. So we've had the fun part of kind of setting the stage and bringing the team along and putting some things on the wall, getting the problems going, getting the discussion going, but this is really where the rubber meets the road around how do we develop the team around us to become problem solvers to help us reach those goals. And so I would say this behavior of leadership is the most difficult aspect to really build and to train as a habit. And it takes practice and it takes just starting to get working on that train. And I, I believe that having a coach or a mentor is a very helpful thing to do, but just to be able to continue to ask the right questions as a leader. Um, Edgar Schein calls it humble, humble inquiry or going in with a learner's mind and really having that humility to go in and ask your team members, what are they seeing? What are their pain points? What problems are they working to solve? And then as a leader, how can I help and support you uh, for us to be able to reach those? So uh, one quick other point on that, people have had it on the slides, so I didn't know if it was worth mentioning, but the four types of problems, so Art Smalley mentions those, that's a critical aspect as well. And it's very difficult um, when you first get going to prioritize between different problems because people love to bring problems to the surface. They love to have that banter and discussion around what they're observing, what they're finding but for you as a leader to be able to help them categorize and put those into the right context of a level one or a level two, getting up to standard, or then a level three, level four, in increasing or innovating towards another standard or target condition, that's a critical way for you as a leader to help them differentiate how, what context and what tools to apply. All right, so on the vein of empathy, and we'll hit these quickly, but these four questions, I love giving these as homework. Any environment I go into for the first time, I have a great introduction training, but part of that training is for us to reflect on these questions. Even if I went out to the shop floor 
or into my office and I ask these to one individual who I traditionally would say hello to or say good morning to or, hey, what's going on? But if you can get into the habit and discipline of saying, hey, what's going well within your role? What needs to be improved? Where do you need help? And then to the point is, where can I support you? How can I support you? This is a difficult question to ask because once you've asked it, you will more than likely over time get an answer that does require action on your part as a leader. So I would say that um, be careful asking it to start out if you're not willing to take the action necessary to give your team member or give your uh, your compatriot there the support that they need in order to work through what they're doing. But over time, as you become more disciplined in your standard work as a leader and as you're going through the Gimba to be able to truly ask these questions, say, how can I support you? and have a, a cadence and a routine for how you're able to do that, that's a powerful way for you to establish that trust and rapport with the team as a leader. I'm sure Mr. Gray will have stories around that in his case study. Two final ones before we turn it over here. So accountability and transparency, a couple of buzzwords again, but accountability is an often misinterpreted, misunderstood word that um, becomes more and more critical as you enter into a, a lean environment. So when problems are put onto the wall, and we're holding each other accountable, the team is accountable to reaching a result. How do you create that culture around it where there is trust and there is mutual respect for people to appreciate that it's not, a, it's not a system for them to get beat over the head with, it's a system for them to solve problems with. And that gives rise to the transparency. So when you have that principle and that guiding tenet of having those issues clearly identified, having those results and metrics that give a clear indication of where you are and where you're heading, that obviously we know bodes well. So, a reference point here, feel free to come back to it, but just a couple quick tick marks. I'm sure there's many more we could add to this, but around engagement. So how do we tell when our team members are in a position where they're contributing, where they're able to engage, and where we as a leader uh, know that we put them in a position to succeed. So we've created the system where people are held accountable, not just individual accountability, but truly to the team and to the organization that they're working with and that they understand their role, they understand the linkage to the results, that they are working day in and day out kind of towards those in a collective sense. Transparency, I like to call this the a la carte menu of problem solving activity and, and obviously uh, use it as a reference, what have you. So just as a view, you get this idea, this daily and virtually constant problem solving activity. I've heard it called the silver bullet of uh, the Toyota success and the organizations that are practicing this lean approach. If you can get your team members from the executive level to the shop floor level, all the value added workers in between for them to be constantly engaged in this problem solving, whether at a huddle meeting, at a visual board and a review session and a quality circle, what have you. There are many of these ways. And then I would also guide your attention to some of these more individual elements or longer term elements around the upskilling and the cross skilling, the training development. Uh, we, we've heard it a lot this last couple of days, great case studies from around the world about organizations are realizing the need for more uh, definition and clarity around what are the role responsibilities, the skills, the roles, responsibilities kind of across the team, um, so to speak, but having a clear mechanism and a clear framework as a company for how we allow our team members to develop uh, towards goals that obviously benefit the company, but in the same vein of that long-term mutual prosperity that are working towards their individual goals as well. And we see some of those mentioned in the bottom right with the personal goals. So, the focus again around the four words you've heard. So the clarity, empathy, the accountability and transparency. How do we as a leader create this system, create this culture, have that intentional sense that what we're doing is really going to affect our team members, our managers, people that we put into positions to allow others to succeed. So it, um, it's a challenge obviously, but I'll turn it over here to Seppo and Mr. Gray to give us a view of how it's been done in a, a very complex and challenging environment. Abby. So Seppo, take it away. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, and then good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody um, around the world. So I'm here with Mr. Dube, um, who we've worked with, and I think um, you know, if, if I'm going to share this story, I need to maybe start with giving the background of actually, you know, how, you know, we came about to say, let's actually involve uh, Mr. Dube in this conversation. So if you maybe go to the next slide for us. Um, so I'll just give the context. So this began with the Lean Institute Africa engaging with the Gauteng uh, Department of Health. That's the provincial 
Office, Administration Office for Public Health Service. So in 2014, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, we uh, called in because the department was dealing with um, a lot of issues. Um, one of the top problems that we identified was complaints due to long waiting times. If you've seen some of those images in a lot of the facilities, there would be long queues. Some patients would wait for the full day and even be intent away without service. And then as a result, then they engaged um, um, the Lean Institute Africa and said, can you maybe just run a pilot to show us that you know we can use Lean to help improve? And as a result, there were four facilities that were grouped and we then ran, uh, you know, we would run a, a five day rapid improvement event, followed by deploying of the daily management system to uh, support and continue that improvement. Now, what you see that was at the end of the, actually the, that rapid improvement event, there was some improvement in terms of reducing that um, waiting time. And we continued until around June 2016. And even then they were able to sustain those improvements because at that time we were still visiting. But now what happened was after we um, stopped supporting um, the, the project, somehow this project was derailed at those sites they lost all of those gains and some of them went even back to where they they used to be and this was all with the exception of that um Leratong hospital which is where mr dube was the ceo in this case this um, facility was even able to start this work in other departments on their own and actually achieve this improvement. So if you go to the next slide. So we then reflected um, um, amongst ourselves as the LIA project team to say, but what is setting up this environment different um, to the others? And really when we looked at it, it was really the involvement of um, the CEO. Um, what we saw was that Mr. Dube was there doing the gambas, he was holding his management team accountable, uh, requiring them to give regular feedback as part of his management uh, meetings. And he gave people space to try out and, and he did quite a lot to, you know, to get the team um, to actually, you know, champion and continue with this, um, you know, with the improvement. Next slide. So, so that's really how we we got to say, but yeah, there was really something about how, you know, Mr. Dube was leading. But now, and maybe as a quick, you know, um, intro, Mr. Dube of yourself. Uh, what's interesting is Mr. Dube started as a clerk. So he joined as a clerk and then he became a CEO, which was a position he hold for 12 years. So if maybe by way of introducing yourself, just key, what are the key lessons that you got from, you know, your journey um, in the department uh, from the time you join us at LAC. Okay, thank you, Tsepo. I think um, my, my, my journey started this at LAC in 1973. And then uh, the key learnings there was that uh, obviously there's a lot of, should be a lot of uh, curiosity as, um, as a leader. I mean, you need to try uh, and think about yourself and your people that you are saving as well as yourself uh, in terms of career. So when I started there, I was a, a clerk with grade 12 and I was just uh, busy working at the counters, you know, getting information from patients. Then I decided to register uh, a technical SA uh, doing a organization and work study in the public service. And that really opened uh, my mind as well as uh, uh, because the attributes of a work study officer, one of them is to be humble be able to ask humbly inquiry questions, to be curious and inquisitive, you know. And then I decided also to do public management and administration at higher level as well. And then mainly I was uh, doing uh, admin, but within a period of about uh, six years, I think the leadership saw the, uh, leadership in me and then the, I, I started progressing from administration up to the level of the CEO. And then at that time, uh, I, I, I was curious to say things 
were doing well, but sometimes people, uh, the results were not sustained. Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, then I was busy, curious, trying to get what could we do to try and sustain what we achieved by then, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if you go to the next slide, because I think you kind of touched on uh, maybe my next question, and but I want to maybe start it with when I listen to the other leaders from the other facilities who um, the engagement at their facilities fell flat, where they they were not supporting the initiative. What was mentioned was you know there was a lot of firefighting in those environment. They were distracted by many things, and as a result, did not give attention to to the lean program. However, when we look at your your scenario, it was not so different because in there we are seeing that in terms of your facility, you know, 855 beds servicing, you know, a community or a population area in your catchment, one and a half million of, of 84 percent of them uninsured um, where you were getting approximately you know, 25,000 visits a month and you are supporting 78 as a, a, a service points. And so this is, you know, showing the demand, that it was quite a lot of demand on your facility. And then you as a CEO, you are, you know, you have a number of uh, stakeholders who demanded time and attention from you. You are re uh, responding, uh, you, you are reporting to the chief director of the district and indirectly you still have to, you know, report to the premier uh, uh, to the office of the MEC, that's the the the, the political head uh, looking after health, and then there's also the head of the department uh, at the head office, and you've got the the board you need to be accounting to. There's the union, you know, organized labor, the community interest groups, your staff. So you were also more or less in this very you know demanding in. Uh, uh, you know, um, scenario. So, but the question is, which you go to the next slide is, but then what attracted you? Because just like those other leaders, yeah. you were in a very demanding um, environment and yet you stayed, you know, you stayed, to, you stayed the, the, the journey. Yeah, I, I think for me, the biggest uh, uh, attraction was that uh, as a leader, you need to view uh, health in a holistic way not as, 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 as an individual uh, of a regional hospital. So what I did, the first thing I, I, I called all the clinics and the district hospitals managers that uh, refer to us. And then we had the meetings uh, uh, to try and understand, to say, is the, the, this big elephant in the room, how best can we approach in trying to manage it? And then uh, the team uh, suggested that, okay, let's start have, having the issues of uh, uh, what we call it referral uh, cluster meetings, where we have clinical managers and uh, nursing will meet and discuss around the challenges around patient care. And then the other thing that also attracted us to be uh, doing lean was that, uh, you know, they, 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 there was a systems that were defined in lean, like for example, process mapping, A3 thinking, uh, uh, visual management, uh, uh, and those systems, you know, the colleagues didn't understand it so well. And then the other thing that also attracted me was that, you know, if you link the behaviors, like the fundamental shingo behaviors, that to that to a willingness, curiosity, uh, humility, self-discipline, and leader standard work, now that also coupled to that, it also led me to understand now as a leader that you need to try and be more on the ground than in your office. Because the more time you spend on the ground interviewing the staff, uh, asking them those humbly uh, questions that uh, Benny referred to that, uh, what can I do to assist you doing your job better? You know, and then uh, that resulted in me having less problem coming to my office. But it's at first, when we started with the leadership, they were so reluctant to leave their offices to go to the Gemba Walks and see what is happening at, at the front line where patient value is created. Now, I took them the first, what, what I call the Gemba Walk. I took them to one of the neonatal units uh, and, and then went with all of them. And then when I was in that neonatal units, 
No, the nurses were just surprised to see what is happening. Are the management coming to chastise us or what? Then I started with them and said, no, I'm here with my executive to observe the great work that you people are doing. And then, you know, the, their faces, the, some of them were surprised to see mm -hmm. why is the <laughs> saying coming to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Then I said, no, as leadership, now we have now adopted the lean management system mm -hmm. where we need to spend the more time interviewing you, seeing what you are experiencing on a daily basis. And as management, we are here to support you in terms of the resources, in terms of the challenges that you have. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then people started to relax now and then and, and, and started talking. Because one of the questions that I asked them to say, what is the biggest problem that you as a leader of this unit, you are trying to resolve? Mm -hmm. And then the people start opening to say, no, no, yeah, I've got the challenges with a, a shortage of staff. Yeah, I can't even have an equipment to use to cool off the babies uh, and then i said fine okay the support that you require from me as a ceo what do you need they will say no i need this instrument i need this i need this and then as management i will say fine team members you heard the stuff what they are saying let's try our best to ensure that we try and meet them halfway with all even if we don't have but let's try and then where we didn't have budget I'll go and look for sponsors. And fortunately, the sponsors also responded. And then uh, within a, a period of a month, I think the staff now realized that no, the management now is here to support, not really chastising us. And uh, and all the other departments also that we visited now, they, you know, it's like they were saying, when is management coming to see us? You know? <laughs> because they could see the, 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 that management is no longer, uh, 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 you know, chastising. Yes, and as yeah. a result of that, uh, I had few problems now coming to my office. Mm. Uh, and then one also, one other thing that also we adopted, the no meeting zone. Mm -hmm. So where we we were we, we in in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, with Dr. Chutu Tusant, we went there with Professor Norman from LIA. And then we saw that now they, they had some days where they say this, there are times of the day that there will be no meeting. Mm. The ESCO of the institution must use that time to go and visit the frontliners, talk to them and see what they are doing, what they are experiencing on a daily basis. And that was really a, a good, a, a good a, a, a progress. And the, the patients were happy, staff was happy. A, a, a complaints were getting lesser. Yeah. So, yes. so effectively, you saw the results. Yes. So the results also attracted you. Yes. The fact that um, the engagement yes. from your yes. staff yes. now they were looking forward yes. to you coming to see them. Yes. So that you would say maybe those are the things that attracted you. Yes. Oh no, thanks. So maybe let's go then to the next slide, which is really looking at the next question. That clearly, I mean, it, it probably was not all smooth sailing. Yes. This, you know, being a leader, you are trying out. You know, you attend these conferences or you are attending these trainings, they introduce these concepts. So, I mean, do you have a, maybe just if you share a case where you were proposing something that, you know, you learned to you and now your management team or your staff said they, they were reluctant. They didn't believe you. But then, you know, after a while, after trying it out, they realized that actually this is working. Yeah. Do you have, I mean, did you encounter those? Do you have one example maybe yeah. that you can share with us? Yeah, I think we, we had a, few, a lot of resistance, especially from the clinicians, I mean, the doctors. So they saw this as a time waster, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we, one of the examples that I will share is one of the clinics uh, in the surgical unit. Uh, and then the doctors there, I think they were challenged by the time that the patients were too many. And then they, they were starting their clinic at the 11 o'clock while the patients were, 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 were coming at the 8 o'clock. Now we went there, as XO, as a, I said to them, man, let's do an observation on this unit, uh, which we call it a, a silent camber walk. And then I spoke to them, then they went there, they saw the patients, they saw the patients were complaining, the doctors were, co were, were not there. And then I said to them, okay, fine. Can you do a process mapping on this unit and see how best we can uh, improve it? 
Uh, some of them will say, no, this is just the administrative burden because of this process mapping. But eventually they agreed to do it. And then uh, that clinic was, the doctors were finishing their, that, that, their shift at six o'clock instead of four o'clock. And then the patients were complaining. Now, after the process mapping, we realized that the doctors were starting their time at, eight, at, 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 at 11. Most of the time, all of them goes to the ward. Mm. And then meantime, there's nobody who's starting the clinic. And then we spoke to them and we convinced them that no, they, your problem is this uh, starting late, going all in the wards. And then some of them started agreeing reluctantly to say, okay, fine, uh, we'll share amongst or we'll share ourselves, uh, two will go to the clinic uh, and then the rest will go to the wards and then we'll interchange. And then once we finish it, the ward will join you. Mm. And then when they started at 8 o'clock and then the other came at 11, I think their first clinic, first day, they finished at around 2 o'clock. Wow. They used to finish after 6, you After said. 6, yes. Now from 6, now they're finishing at, at 2. 2 o'clock. Now yeah. they saw that, no, man, this system works because now we are now going off earlier. Yes. And then we can, we don't, and then they started, you know, buying into the system. And then I can, I can mention many examples. Yeah. But this was the key one. that yes. because. Because patients were happy and then they were the all were so happy. happy that they, they also benefited. You know? Instead of living at six o'clock, two hours yeah. more, they were getting two hours, uh, one hour less, you know, wow. or two hours less. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that was our ha in uh -huh. terms of that clinic of uh, surgical OPD in Radung. Yeah. Now, that's yeah. thanks. Thanks for sharing that. No, that's a great example. So if you go to our, I mean, my last question is based on my observation when I was at Leratung Hospital, you know, I saw that in the waiting areas um this is um, a requirement in a lot of the hospitals because i saw that the other hospitals they will just have the pictures of the management team but what i saw at Leratong hospital when mr dube was ceo is they would have the pictures of the management team with their titles and their contact numbers mobile numbers i mean can you just maybe share how did it you know come about that you did that and what was the experience of if you just shared that with us yeah no no you see our us that came about when there was a lot of complaints after hours mm -hmm. and then when i arrive in the morning the matrons will share me that there were a lot of complaints patients were complaining that the doctors were not there nurses were rude and then i decided to no, know man instead instead of the patients now struggling to lodge their complaints after hours and let, let, let's let's display our numbers our cell phone numbers our email address uh, in the busiest areas of the hospital and then and in all other areas as well and then we discovered that now the first we we week i mean i received a lot of complaint i think it was more than 20 at, at night you know some of them around 12 o'clock but i was patiently attending to all those problems and referring them to the right relevant managers and then within uh, two weeks i received two complaints at night and then probably after a month i hardly uh, received the complaints in two weeks because now managers were aware that patients were have direct access to me they have direct access to the medical managers and then when i received complaints i'll phone the medical manager to say there's a problem in your area please attend to your doctors and then let, give me the feedback mm -hmm. and that also helped to reduce the number of complaints afterwards patients were happy and then the the, 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 the the executives who complain that now by putting our numbers there will be exposing ourselves one rest mm -hmm. but they were appreciating because now they used they were resting now when they, we came in the morning we had not been uh, bombarded with lots of complaints that happened after hours so that really helped you know yeah that, that that was a good system which i i also encourage my colleagues to to put because now it also reduced the number of complaints that goes to the province that goes to the mm. uh, district you know yeah it, i mean the ceo will be you know connected understanding what is happening in the institution and also trying to to come with me a, a, a remedial action yeah no yeah. thank you thank you mr Dube. i think that's a brilliant example which really i think uh, demonstrates all of this this traits that we're speaking about because it's really courageous because i don't think your management team 
were happy there. Eh? Were they happy? No, they were not happy. They were, <laughs> no. like, they were resistant. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So but they, eventually they, they saw the benefit of, yes. of those of those pictures and the numbers. You know? yeah. yeah. So I think that's that's it for us because I think with that short conversation, at least I think we've managed to demonstrate um those key attributes of curiosity, looking to develop yourself, having courage to try and do this, um, what looks like very challenging. And you're doing it because you care about your people and, and your, cust- uh, you know, your clients or your customers. So I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, to Ben and then we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll obviously stay here until there are, there are questions at the end of our chat. Thank you, Ben. No, thank you guys. That's a fantastic case study and it is lovely having your wisdom, Mr. Dubain, to have the initial glimpse of what Lean can do and some of the principles and tools but then to put it into action and realize the resistance and realize the initial conflict perhaps that you went through, um, I, you obviously can appreciate that journey. And I appreciate the good thinking. So the ideas that were coming to your mind as the leader, just to be able to take those and, and be respectful, but then to create or improve the system that you had your team in and have that be something that they could use to get even better. So a uh, great practical example. I loved hearing it. So that was a privilege to, to be part of. Um, Let's focus then on some of the traits that were mentioned, and then we'll use these just to tie off on our final element here with collaboration. But as we heard, the the courage to have a long-term outlook, to be the one that kind of throws the stone down the road and says, here's where we're heading. I've I've seen it. I know what's possible. I know what we're capable of doing as a team. Let's give ourselves a a vision and a target that we can work towards uh, collectively. And then alignment and priority. So as we begin on that journey, how do we continue to create the systems, to create the way that we can be on the same page and, and create that alignment to results and to metrics and goals. And then I think curiosity, what a good term if you can put that into practice. And especially as a leader, I think this is where you sometimes, uh, or at least I can speak from my, my young experience, but when you've seen things happen before and you've been in a lean transformation, you've been in other organizations, uh, you, you kind of forget where you were and you just take it for granted that you have that knowledge. And so I think having that curiosity to go back to the learner's mindset and realize that not everybody has done this before. Not everybody's been through some of the challenges you heard from Mr. Dubé. Not everybody's had the challenges of engaging the team or bringing the team along the journey of making these problems visible. So it's that curiosity to, again, continuously learn and be part of that journey and not just the one that kind of steps back and lets them mess around a bit. Self-development as well. I'm I'm sure over the, the course of your career, Mr. Dubé, you've taking it upon yourself to learn, to read, to teach, to write, et cetera, to be able to practice those traits as a leader, to be sharing your message with others. And I I appreciate you being here to do that with us. Um, So great to hear the traits. Collaboration, let's let's focus on these as our final elements. And I'm, I'm taking this more high level perhaps just with this thinking of what Lean is capable of. We've heard it from the perspective of a servant leader. So somebody that works for others, somebody that is getting in early, staying late, thinking on behalf of the team, they're bringing me these problems to start. And me as the leader, it's not that I'm taking those and solving them, because we know from other lessons that that would be disrespectful if we're not uh, teaching how to fish, if we're just giving the fish, that's not a sustainable system. So the servant leadership mentality is, hey, I want to create the system for my team to bring me the problems. But over time, I need to be a couple steps ahead to be able to think through how do I coach them to get down that path. I'm not just giving them the answer. I'm not just kind of working through it on, on my own and giving it back to them. It's me as a servant leader. How do I help coach and guide and share that uh, lesson that they're able to learn and in turn teach others? Um, so servant leadership, obviously we've heard of in different contexts and then systems perspective. So you mentioned it there as well uh, during the interview, but the idea of things working together in an interrelated standpoint. And we heard some great uh, lessons last night on supply chains and some of the JIT and just on just in time elements that aren't working as well as we know they could at this point in time. But it's this idea that everything is so interconnected, the world that we live in, the communities that we are part of, the businesses that we work within. So we need to be thinking as leaders, how do my decisions impact the others? How do we be thinking more to collaborate versus compete? And we know that from the prisoner's dilemma. So if we're all optimizing for our own best interest, that doesn't lead to a good outcome. So the systems perspective is an important thing as a leader to practice and to take upon yourself to learn more and go through that research. So the two final elements here in the last five or so minutes, long-term mutual prosperity, and then we'll touch on partnership. So this long-term mutual prosperity idea is uh, sometimes esoteric and nebulous, 
but I, I love it. And it, it, for me, really helped capture what is the purpose of a lean enterprise or a business. And people sometimes give it a knock and, oh, it's all about profitability, all about returns. It says, hey, that's part of the company's goals. In order to be sustainable and to be able to make these contributions, we need to have a profit. And we're going to have that as a clear goal that we're bringing the team along that journey in order to help us to get there. And we're setting that as a target, as a result. And then we want to be respectful. So when we bring an employee in, that they have their sets of goals as well. Every individual we know is wired differently, but we want to be cognizant and mindful of the individuals that we're bringing onto our teams, what motivates them intrinsically, and what can we do not only to create a safe workplace, to create meaningful work, to engage them in problem solving, but also how do we show them a clear path for growth? How do we, again, flesh out some of those personal goals to be able to understand what they're wanting to learn is in line with what we need to be learning as an organization to be more effective? So this idea of long-term mutual prosperity can otherwise be known as win-win and a very simple concept. And, and many teachers over time have taught that well, but if we can truly be thinking win-win and the decisions that we're making and the systems that we're creating, it, we know by principles that over time that does bode well. And that blue arrow, we see that mutual trust. This is the most difficult aspect. So it's very easy to do the lip service and very easy to kind of start these things. But over time, if there's not follow-up, if there's not transparency, if there's not that back and forth between the leader and the team member that they trust that we're on the same page, then it quickly degrades. So this mutual trust is something that must be tended uh, very, very often with discipline on a regular basis to have those conversations, ask those humble inquiry, those coaching questions to make sure that we don't let problems dam up. We are always continuing to solve and make progress. And then a key term, and this is emblazoned. I remember it being on the walls in Toyota City, my first trip to Japan, today for tomorrow, and having this mentality that the decisions, the actions that we're taking today, the improvements of today are going to be manifest, whether tomorrow is the next day or next week or 15 years, 100 years from now. It's just that thinking of long term, uh, not only for mutual prosperity, but also with how you have a role as part of your ecosystem. So in this vein, we see it. It's branching off from the company. The company has its members and the, the families that make up that ecosystem. And then in turn, the community and society. And we've seen Toyota illustrate this very well and we use them as an ideal, but any business or any operation in any part of the world has such a widespread ripple effect that can grow over time just through the, the team members that are there, the families that are kind of there with them. And a quick story on that, I remember being in Japan on that, I think that same trip, and we went through a Toyota supplier, did a great factory tour. We were back in the conference room and uh, the president of the company was saying, my favorite moment of the day is that 8 a.m. bell. And Mr. Dubey, you made me think of that at 8 a.m., but he said 8 a.m. every morning is when the machines start up. It's when all my team members are working at their operations and I can look out the window or I can be there on the floor and I can hear them humming. And that, that's just my favorite part. And he said, well, that is just because that's when you start making money. Is that right? And that's when everything's going. He said, no, no. That's one small part, but the biggest part is that if my team members are at their workstations at 8 a.m. every day, that means that now I'm in the position of responsibility to put them in the right position to learn, to grow, to develop. It means that their families are in good health, their children are at school, they're taken care of, they made it here safely today to work, and now me as the leader, how do I best utilize their time and make them as successful and effective as they can be? And whoa, that's that's a big challenge. But when you when you begin to look at it and appreciate that you're creating these systems, you're the steward of the system, then you you get more and more motivated to think more broadly than just that one world that you might be working in. And people find that truly engaging and inspiring to be part of. And so we talk about this idea of purpose that, hey, if, if we're bringing people in and promising them good pay and good benefits or whatever, that will keep them for so long. But we've seen, as we mentioned before, people very quickly will we become disengaged or they'll lack the fulfillment or whatever. And we have to be continually going through this, setting a vision that truly inspires our team, that they appreciate their role and the contributions that they're making to the vision and mission of the company that does think just beyond the walls of the, the one environment. Um, I throw these in here just as a quick little demographic point and context around where we're heading in the world. And I do this because we are speaking to you from South Africa, from uh, Cape Town, Johannesburg. But if we look at population over the next call it 80 to 100 years, we realize that we're in the midst of a demographic shift. So we see this top left hand side, this graph, that purple line you see is Africa's population growth. The green line on the top is Asia's population growth. And we see the other countries there below. 
And then South Africa is a country bottom left hand side. You can see a very similar trajectory that they're on. And then you look at the world and these are the population pyramids, so to speak, so they're showing the age kind of up the, uh, up the, the Y axis there. This is painting a very clear picture that there's youth, there's a tremendous amount of youth in these developing countries, developing economies. And um, there's not as much of that youth in, in countries we know, such as Japan and Western Europe, and even the US is in that category a bit. So I'm, I put these on the page because the, the topic of our discussion today is building these lean leadership traits for the next generation. And I think Mr. Gray, you've illustrated it perfectly that our leaders, and I've been very blessed in my career to have learned from some great mentors and, and people that are older, obviously have the wisdom, have the gray hair, but I think in turn, you realize the responsibility of how do you con continue to pass those traits, continue to pass those elements that we've heard on to the next generation. So that over time with this population growth, especially in these developing countries, we know we need leaders that are thinking win-win, that are thinking at a systems level, that are thinking collaboration. If we can have more of that, I believe the world would be a better place. So I, I put these here because that's the heart I have to be in South Africa. And I know that's the heart of our Lean Institute team to be able to spread these principles and then create that system of collaboration. And just on that final note, um, I've been doing some study recently with W. Edwards Dimming, and I'm sure everybody's heard of him through quality management, et cetera. Uh, just a fantastic guru of the field. And so his book, and talking about the new economy, new economics, um, looking at the role of different stakeholders across these ecosystems. So these partnerships, I believe with the lean mindset, we can put these into practice and easier said than done, obviously, but I think to help illustrate it, it helps clarify the roles of each of these stakeholders from a business, education, government, and civil society standpoint. If we can articulate what's the standard or what are we working towards? What's the ideal vision that each of these different stakeholders are working towards that oftentimes are, are optimized for the silo. We heard that before, compete or collaborate. Hey, I'm, I'm driven to compete because that's what I know optimizes the world I operate in. But if we can over time be thinking again, the role of the business within their community, within their society, and, and in turn, all these other stakeholders you see, how do we then kind of continue to participate in this collaboration? And I had this question mark on the top here because it's it's difficult to define what does a win-win look like for all these different stakeholders? And I don't I don't believe the world is on the same page with what those are. So I'll give the best current example of that. And we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals just as a, a, a clear standard. And I like the language that they use saying no poverty, uh, zero hunger. So they're giving some very clear targets that we want to reach. And I'm sure we can all agree upon that there's a lot of good in those elements. There's some that we would, I'm sure, uh, debate a bit, but to the point, if we can align as a global ecosystem as what are we working towards and then using some of those lean principles as problem solving that discussion, that collaboration to take us forward towards it. I mean, we can't disagree with the principles. So I think I put that out there just as a challenge with whatever context, whatever role you find yourself in, how can we be thinking broader? How can we be thinking not only the direct lens in front of us, but the systems we operate in, but how do we look at some of these other partnerships and stakeholders as well? All right, on that note, I will open the floor up for questions. We got uh, five or 10 minutes here. Anton will help us facilitate in the chat, but we would love to hear from you and then make this an interactive session if there's anything we can clarify or expand upon. Thanks, Ben, uh, Tsepo, and uh, especially Mr. Dubé. Um, I have to say that was once again an inspiring story to hear. <clears throat> so, um, we don't actually having uh, any questions at this moment. Um, if you do have any, please put them in the chat and uh, we'd be happy to respond to them. So it looks like we're gonna have time for a small bonus. Um, <laughs> ben, if you can let me share, then I would like to share a video of Mr. Dubé and the next generation. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so um, let's see if I can do that. Conquer the technology. Um, unfortunately, it seems my computer has frozen. <laughs> These things tend to happen. That's, that's all right. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> um, so, um, Perhaps you could, if you've got it on YouTube or whatever, you could post that into the chat. Maybe. Yeah, well, unfortunately, my, my computer is not cooperating at all. 
Um, I'm just glad you can still hear me talk. Um, so uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, I'm just going to have to tell you about the, the little bonus video, which is uh, a video once we, I, we were on a study visit at Leritong Hospital and uh, um, Mr. Dubey was explaining to us how he was doing his uh, management and he talked about doing gimbal walks, but he didn't just do gimbal walks. He also had his assistant, a junior lady in his office, accompany him as his buddy to observe his behavior and give him feedback after the Gemba walk on how he was doing. And uh, in, in the, uh, the kind of organization that he was uh, leading, that was definitely breaking the mold because it, uh, in, in the public sector in South Africa, certainly is still very top down and, uh, and asking uh, somebody more junior than yourself to, to give you feedback uh, definitely uh, was very, very noticeable. And in the video, uh, this lady shares how uh, uh, empowered she felt and, and how that inspired her to do greater things herself, uh, given such uh, great. All right, so with that, I think uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Um, we do have one question, Anton, here from Adam. And he asked the question kind of on the vein you were speaking there. But how do we overcome command and control management thinking and move to lean leadership? And especially if leaders won't go to the Gimba. So um, I, I think that's a, so a I think Mr. Question Dube, um, <laughs> I think okay. that one we must uh, pass to you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Seppo and Mr. Dubey dropped off there. They might join back with us, but my answer to that question, Adam, would be start within your span of control. And you might have heard it in a couple of the talks yesterday, but kind of if you can practice the lean leadership behaviors on your own accord to start and then become the champion, so to speak, in that vein of going to the Gimba, of going and asking those leadership questions, of asking where the pain points are, how can I help you to solve these problems that you're helping me to identify? And you, you begin to gain the rapport. And I've felt that, and that's a respect that you obviously hold on to when you're in a new environment. If you can ask those questions of the team, they look at you as a leader because you're asking the right questions, the principle-based questions. And so I think that that sets the example. And I've, I've seen it more often than not. If you can have respect for your, your peers or people that would, in your view, be one of those lean leaders that isn't living up to the standard, that if you can even demonstrate it so consistently and do that on a daily basis, regular basis, ask those questions. I believe over time that they'll ask you, well, what, what is your secret? How, how did you get so good at this? People look up to you differently. They speak to you differently. And I would say you, you continue to practice those traits and those principles and, and being respectful. So I think first do with what's in your control. So obviously you can only control yourself to get going in that journey. And then over time, as your influence grows as a leader, obviously you make that the standard. And you say our standard to what we heard earlier, we're gonna do no meetings on a Thursday afternoon so that everybody goes at the Gimba. And we might have to print out a little template with some questions that they need to ask. So we have gotta go baby steps to start, but you build those habits little by little, build those habits and over time, uh, the leadership behavior improves and the team, the way they're looking at that behavior. Okay, Ben, thanks very much. Um, if you wouldn't mind checking whether there are any other questions. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and if we, not, I think we'll close the session and, and give uh, our uh, audience a uh, few minutes I back there's a, there's a, before there's a the next about session starts. Control. Thanks again and once it, once again for uh, to everybody uh, that uh, uh, came to see the session. And uh, we hope to see you soon in one of the next sessions. Bye then. Anton, Anton can you hear us? I think Anton wants to, wants to head off to lunch. <laughs> I, I thought there's a question on the command and control. Yeah, and and I think we we've got a couple minutes left, so if, if people want to hang on, that's uh that's perfectly fine. And, and Anton, sorry to jump in on on the close, but um, we didn't let you give a, a opportunity there, Mr. Dubé, to answer the question. So we we were on that vein with the story of how you behaved at the Gimba and how you behaved when the team members um, were asking you the questions, but. 
Is there a response that you would give Mr. Dubé, if you can read that question there, how would you overcome some of that command and control thinking? Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I think in terms of uh, command and control, I think <clears throat> what we, what I did as a, as, as a leader was uh, uh, learning this uh, Shingo fundamental behaviors. I think uh, those started with willingness, humility, uh, under humility, you go and see, and then curiosity, you listen to the people, you respect the individuals, and then uh, obviously when you in that gamba walk, you know, yo, 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 this single principle will mold you mm. into the uh, 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 listening more. Uh, respecting individuals and then building future leaders because your goal is to develop future leaders so once they see that the leader is supportive is respectful and uh, and, and obviously it it will change my behavior because how the people are viewing me and they are respecting me and that is really led me to the change behavior and I managed to, 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 to get a lot of respect from professors, uh, clinicians, because of the humility and the respect that I afforded to people and the support that uh, I give to people. And that, that, that really showed that the, the leader cares for us. And whenever they are in problems, I'm with them. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I work with them. Yeah. I, I think, Mr. Dewey, what you're saying, because there's something that you mentioned then the other time we spoke, um, it's connected still to what you're saying, is that you shared that when you were still operating under command and control, you saw that when there were interventions, uh, when there was a problem, uh, people will do something only when you're there. And then, yeah. and then when you go away, um, it, they revert back to the old ways. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Because definitely they were not pro uh, trained as problem solvers. In fact, they, they were just uh, trying to please you when you are there. When you go back, they go back hobbies. But once you start developing them uh, with this lean management system, process mapping, visual board, and then they, they also enjoy to come and report to me on a, in the exco meeting on a Mondays to say this is what we did in the uh, pharmacy, this is what we did in, in SOD. These are the headless that we manage in, in those uh, clinics. So, so, so that, that, that really uh, uh, was, a, was a, an opening for me and uh, it really helped me to, to grow as a leader. But the main Fantastic. thing is to respect every individual, whether you are a cleaner, whether you are a professor, whether you are whoever, you need to greet and, and and really see people that and show people that you care you know yeah irrespective of their levels hmm. yeah yeah now uh, mr dubay to hear your your insight and your firsthand experience as a servant leader it, it does give you the inspiration because obviously i know seppo and i were, were a bit younger um and we've learned the principles we've learned how to start doing these things but to hear your perspective on, on putting it into practice that it, uh, it paves the way well so it gives a, a good heart and the motivation for continuing to move forward. So I think we are now officially out of time and, and thank you all um, for joining us and thank you for joining in for the whole conference. We'll continue to enjoy it for the next couple of hours and we look forward to seeing you hopefully one day soon in South Africa. So, so long for now. Thank you. Bye everyone.